So let's talk about the NetGate SG1100. And uh, I've been playing with it for a little while. It's an interesting little device. I really do like it. But I'm gonna save you from watching the rest of this video if you're that person that goes, does this little $159 US box perform gigabit routing with full Sericata, full IDF, PF blocker, and everything turned on, and I want it to route gigabit VPN. Sorry, doesn't do that. Turn a video off, buy something else. I don't really have an answer for you. I've had a few people send me some weird messages. Um, I, I would love if we are at a point in technology where I can get gigabit at $159 with all said features enabled and all turned on. This box won't do it for you. I'm just going to throw that out there from the rip. Uh, we are going to talk about VPN speed. We'll talk about some of the other features and what it does route at. Um, and they have this published on the site already. There's not any secrets here. I'll leave a link to the NetGate blog where they talk about the different speed. And it is a fast box. Don't get me wrong. But if you want gigabit and you want Sericata and you want VPN, I'm sorry, this box isn't going to do it. Even this box, which is a little bit more money, and I've reviewed this one here. This is your SG3100. Has no problem at the gigabit speed, but does only have about roughly roughly 100 megs or so. I haven't tested it in a little while to see if any of the driver updates have made it faster on OpenVPN routing. So this is the thing. Anytime you do any type of high-end cryptographic encoding, decoding, which is how VPNs work to protect your secrets, they have to encode and decode them. That has a cost of processing power. That cost of processing power means you will have to buy something fast enough to process at the speed that you want. So those are things you have to research, but I figured I'll clear that up real quick. Uh, Physical-wise, though, comparing it to the SG3100 to the SG1100 um, here, not bad. It's a much smaller package. It's lighter. Uh, this has this big heat sink on the bottom. This does have a heat sink, but it's covered up with plastic. We're going to take it apart in a second and show you what's inside. Um, power adapter. So I have them on the counter here. This is obviously a much bigger power brick when you have the NetGate SGLE 3100 one. It's more wattage, hence has more power, hence can do some of those things faster that you might be looking for. Versus your standard little tiny baby wall adapter here. Uh, this is a really lightweight, I think it's about 3.8 watts at idle uh, in terms of wattage use. This is great for home users. I'm gonna highly recommend it for that. So without further ado, let's get to the more exciting part where first we're gonna take it apart. And after we take it apart, then we'll dive into some of the speed tests, VPN tests, and uh, show you around on it. Now, as far as software goes, it's PF Sense, so I'm not gonna spend a ton on the operating system that runs it. Uh, it's not as relevant. It's the same PF sense on any of the other devices. Few noted differences. And what that noted difference is, this is essentially a system on a chip. And what that means is, and I'll show you when we get into the software, the VLANs are set up a little bit different because it has a series of VLANs to divide up the chips. Kind of, it's the best way to describe it is you have a two and a half gig backplane. You have one gig physical ports on here. So your one gig physical ports are subdividing that two and a half gig backplane, giving you the potential to route gigabit between each of the individual ports, and but still divide it out because of the way the backplane works. And that's actually the way other NetGate devices work as well. That does include this one. So they do have that as a design um, that is documented, but it does create some if you're not familiar with it, but it's well documented, so RTFM, uh, how you set these up internally when you're, if you want to mess with the VLANs on these, real easy documentation, follow the instructions on there uh, as, as much as I'm going to talk about that. So let's uh, pop these little rubber feet off and take it apart. Once you remove the th four screws, I almost said three, that are uh, hidden by the little feet that are on the bottom, you get to see the heat sink. Now the heat sink in this, Pretty kind of beefy here. It's actually a pretty good size heat sink to dissipate the heat generated by this. Um, and you can see they use a little bit of heat sink paste and we have our chips right there. Now let's uh, go ahead and pop this board out carefully without sticking my fingers in the goo. And we'll flip it over. We do have a PCIe slot right here. And we have some mystery jumpers that uh, if I'm feeling ambitious, maybe in another video, I might mess with those. <laughs> I don't know what they do. I did look a little bit. I didn't see anything immediately uh, jumping out at me to tell me whether or not they are uh, some type of what, what they do, I should say. I, I just don't know. I don't know what options they can figure. Uh, but the board looks well put together. The solder and everything's really clean on it. There's nothing that stood out um, 
at all that made it look anything less than excellent manufacturing on this. So uh, that made me happy. Looks like the, it says global scale on there. So I guess it's probably the board manufacturer. Um, I also noticed it looks like, and maybe they have another version of this board that it, you could have a, uh, slot on here and maybe they have another version in the pipe i i don't know at all that's would have cell support and that would actually be kind of cool to have a small box like this and also have like a 4g or even in the future 5g backup on there um so just kind of novel but right now to my knowledge i don't know that you can do a usb style with the arm boards when it comes to some of the backup and failover but the board in everything is like well compact into this box it's all nice uh, well-made plastic. It's really shiny. Uh, so yeah, other than that, not much else to talk about it with it. The other mystery chip that I don't know what it is, but I'm going to surmise that this is the TPM module they talked about because this claims to have that first module that verifies that it's authentic PFSense software on here that is from the NetGate folks. And this is important because you don't want to have a firmware you got that was hijacked uh, swapping things around or not having an official firmware on here because obviously that's kind of a security risk. I don't know how much of an attack it is. Um, obviously, I always update mine directly from PFSense. So I always, if I buy these from PFSense, I'm always using their updates. Uh, so it's neat. This is the first device that's had it on there. I don't know what all that means because they've been kind of vague about it other than it's to uh, trust and verify that their system. If they would love to enlighten me, I would be more than happy, but it, I, hopefully they'll enlighten all of us with a blog post or something like that. But uh, this fits in there well. It doesn't wobble around so it sits nice and tight. We're just going to put it back together and get to the important part where we talk about how fast does this thing go and what features does it have. So let me put these screws back in. All right, so we have the device all set up, configured. I loaded PF blocker on here, which is something most people will probably want to do. Great for syncing ads and things like that. I've got a video and tutorial on how to do that. I've loaded uh, OpenVPN on here because people want to know the VPN performance. How fast is the VPN? completely fair question. We're going to test that. And of course, how fast does it route? So we're going to cover that too. First, let's just look real quick at the configuration here. We have a WAN address of 192.168.50.169. So that is the WAN side. This black cable is what's going to the WAN side. Then on the LAN side, it, we left it at the default 192.168.11 network, you know, completely stocked there. And then we added the OpenVPN client export, and then I added a PF blocker. And like I said, that's the only configuration changes I made other than opening up the ports needed to make those things work. So it's pretty much stock. But let's first show you real quick that little bit of confusion that maybe some people have about how the Marvel chip works and how the VLANs work. And like I said, refer to the documentation to understand it a little better, but this is how the VLAN is divided up because when you have the default VLAN group zero, VLAN tag one, that is the two and a half gig backplane. And then it's subdivided to VLANs 4090, 4091, 4092. Now those are statically set and you cannot change them. Those VLANs are so you can divide up the chip on this device um, into its separate segmented networks. So that's just a little side note to its functional design. There's documentation on here. And yes, it does support more VLANs. Yes, it supports uh, more settings, but you can't reuse. So if you have some reason that you have to have uh, 4090, 4091, or 4092 in your VLAN tagging, uh, those are reserved for the system on a chip as far as I understand. Um, so just well, those little side notes. Want to make sure you're aware of that. Other than that, there's nothing else special from here on out. It's all just normal PF sense. Now, the first thing you're going to notice as I'm flipping through here is even loading the front page of this, this thing's fast. Uh, this DDR4 memory and this Marvel chip are no joke. I'm really impressed with how fast it loads the packages. Um, it even was reasonably fast downloading the packages for PF Blocker, which, by the way, has to expand all those block lists for the ads. Anyways, back to the topic of this. Let's show the speed test. So I wanted to get right into that. So as I stated, don't do it one more time because people have a lot of confusion. The server is just plugged into a switch that this is going to be attaching to. I use iPer for all my testing. It's a really common, open source, easy to use testing suite. So all of the testing is going to be going from this particular laptop via this one little green cable I have right here to the NetGate box. Then out of the NetGate box into another switch and attached to that switch is another Linux server. 
I have tested plugging this directly into my computer and I have no problem getting full gigabit speed. So the only thing doing the routing right now is going to be this, so there's nothing else in between other than these uh, switches, but there's no more routing besides that. And I bring that up because it's really important to understand that it is passing through the NetGate device. There's always some people asking, well, does it really pass through the NetGate device? I'm like, yes, I'm not testing it on the same LAN. It goes through the NetGate over to the server. I just want to make sure that's super clear. Now, here is the iPerf test. We're going to connect to that uh, server. That's 192.168.50.166. And the WAN on this is 169. So we're going to go out from the laptop and over to this. And we're seeing about uh, 746, 693. It's bouncing back and forth. But we're getting in that 700 megasecond range for these. Now, that's important because we're getting it there with TCP. It seems to go a little bit faster for UDP. And I bring that up because a lot of the protocols that are going to be trans uh, going across this, transporting across this, are going to be UDP. And I say that because refer to my quick video, QIC. A lot of the internet's moving to quick because it compresses better, it handles better. Um, so this actually seems to go just a little bit faster with UDP traffic, so we're going to run this here. Now you're seeing 900 megs a second, but by the way, it's dropping some of the packets. So I forced it to try to get to a higher speed. I know it's losing a little bit of the packets. So it lost about 24%. So it's still maybe a little bit faster than the 700. So like 750 to 800, it looks like. Um, might be more of the line speed on there. So just so you know, it will do UDP slightly faster. Now, I also have an OpenVPN client attached to this. And this is the IP 192.168.70.2. Two. That is another computer I have on the other side of the network VPN back into this. So what we're going to do, it's running iperf server on its given IP address, the 70.2. So now we're going to iperf to that and see how it performs with OpenVPN. And I'm using OpenVPN, not IPsec. The IPsec performance should be better than the OpenVPN performance. But I don't. I mean, maybe you're using this for some IPsec because it's public or public. But a lot of the questions I have are usually around OpenVPN and OpenVPN because it's popular for different tools that you use, such as um, PIA, offer a link below on them if you want to sign up for a PIA VPN. And PIA VPN will, you could set that to route so you could tunnel all of your traffic through there, but the limitation is going to be how fast can this route. So let's go ahead and test that real quick. So we're just going to do a standard TCP routing, iperf-c192.168.70.2. And I'm pretty impressed here. Uh, this is able to route, uh, we're going to get a total here at the end, about 123 megasecond average. So that's actually quite fast. Now, as I understand, and I'm not an engineer, um, but I've seen this in the NetGate forums, and they do not have at present a crypto chip on here fully supported. So that is going to be a support they're adding to this uh, later with drivers. Also, by the way, these drivers are really new in the BSD world. So there's going to be undoubtedly improvements on them. So what I tested at today, it may get faster. So if this meets your needs today, awesome. And if we're lucky, we'll get some drivers that will meet your needs for tomorrow. So it will possibly reach line speed, which it's really close to it now. So if you you know, if you if you have like I do at home, I have a 300 meg connection at home, um, and this is actually uh, destined for my house. It's what I'm going to be using because it's nice and cute and small and has PF blocker, and I don't really need many more performance than that. I, I do like the ad blocking features that it has in there. Um, so this is going to end up being my home device. That's why I set it up as many home users will. So this should be fine for most home users, like I said. But if you have uh, you're blessed enough to have gigabit routing at home, awesome. You may want to go with something a little bit faster if that's really uh, something that matters to you. And like I said, just step up a little bit more to the uh, SG3100 and you're back up to line speed. Now, the last thing I want to show you is what happens to this when you're downloading a torrent. So I'm downloading Tails, which is a Linux distro for the Tor project. But the reason I'm doing a torrent as opposed to another test is because torrenting is very, very taxing on firewalls. and this is no exception to this. One of the things about torrenting is there's a lot of state tables that pop up because there's so many connections going on with the Tor. But this handled that fine. So this is an important thing that 
even if a firewall can route really fast, there is the older firewalls that used to run into problems uh, where they had trouble if you ran a tour or even playing games. Because once you start playing a game and there's too many streams going on, it can't handle this. This seems to have no problems at all uh, handling tour traffic, handling that, and that's all the different state tables involved in tracking it. Now, this is one of those features about PFSense that I really like, and what's made it always to be a really solid firewall is its ability to handle a lot of different sessions, even if it's all compacted down to a small ARM package. Um, when even we tested a long time ago, the uh, SG-1000, the very first model I remember seeing that they had of this ARM basis, it was able to handle quite a bit. I know it wasn't near as fast as this. That's been a number of years. Um, and they've come a real long way. So that's important, though, that it did that. That Tor took no time at all to download. Does it have a statistic on here? Yeah, it's only took less than two minutes to download 1.2 uh, gigs. And like I said, that's important because of the number of streams involved in downloading that. Uh, that makes a big difference. So it didn't have any problems. It does make the CPU uh, CPU usage go up a little, but it never pinned it, uh, even downloading Torrent. So that's kind of a, one little test I like to run when I'm testing the firewalls. All right, now as the final piece of this video is testing it at home, and this is installed at my house. You see the local IP address here because I'm logged in via OpenVPN from my office uh, to home. No problems doing that. Uh, everything works just like it does in any version of PFSense. So that's one nice thing. The, just because it's running on ARM, I didn't see anything different about it that I, with any x86 PFSenses that we use, in case anyone's wondering. Um, but the two CPUs are idling for the most part. So uh, state tables, pretty low. I don't have that much going on at my house. But we, when I've played video games or uh, had more torrents running than what you guys seen in the uh, demo here, it handled it very smooth. I didn't have any issues with that. Also, for the um, memory usage with PF blocker uh, set up running with all the ad blocking, blah, 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 it, no problems. It's sitting at 13% memory usage. So I'm actually... Uh, happy with how efficient all of that is and it's very responsive in terms of dns speed and things like that also traffic shaping is turned on so if you go over here firewall and we go over here to traffic shaper limiters i'm using the uh, coddle queue uh, to do it i didn't bother with any specific traffic shaping but it's supported in this so if you uh, need traffic shaping this box does do that but i think it's a great buy at only 159 bucks it's Really easy, less expensive way to get into PFSense. So if you're trying to think about building one, it's hard to build something that's this fast at that price point. I know you could find something used. I know you could slap something together. Uh, but this is, a, to me, a really good price for that. And I know someone's going to point out that you can find some device out there by some other company that will do uh, less than $100 and can do gigabit routing. But you're not going to get all the features you get with PFSense. So in terms of the extensibility of the PFSense software and all the uh, advanced networking features that come with it. It's really impressive. They packed a lot of that into a box that's only $159, and it's officially from them. So if you want to buy it, head over to their website. It's not something I have any affiliate links or offer for. I review these uh, on my own. They did not send it to me. I purchased this device myself. So um, it's the same purchase price that you'll pay too. I paid $159 plus shipping for it. Uh, so that may vary with wherever you ha are or if you're over in Europe, UK, EU. Um, you have to check for local dealers for pricing and things like that, but I'm not an official uh, PF Sense dealer, so I did buy this on my own review it because I like and trust the product, not because they paid me. But if they want to pay me, you know, that would be biased, so that's why I'm not looking for them to pay me in case anyone's wondering about that or my affiliation with them. So uh, I think I like their product. We trust their product. That's why we like, that's why I review their products. So, all right, take care. And uh, if you want to carry on the discussion, oh, feel free to head over to the forums. Thanks. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you want to subscribe to this channel to see more content, hit that subscribe button and the bell icon, and maybe YouTube will send you a notice when we post. If you want to hire us for a project that you've seen or discussed in this video, head over to lawrencesystems.com where we offer both uh, business IT services and consulting services and are excited to help you with whatever project you want to throw at us. Also, if you want to carry on the discussion further, head over to forums.lawrencesystems.com where we can keep the conversation going. And if you want to help the channel out in other ways, we offer affiliate links below which offer discounts for you and a small cut for us that does help fund this channel. And once again, thanks again for watching this video and see you on next time.